Hello and welcome to my channel where I'll be telling you all kinds of strange stories ranging from true crime to some much less believable although just as fascinating tales. For today's video we have the twisted tale of Tony and Barbara Bakeland. Listen in and see what you think. Barbara Daly was born in 1921 in Boston. When she was 11, her father Frank committed suicide using the exhaust of his car. As if this wasn't horrific enough for an 11 year old to deal with, Barbara was the one who found her father. This surely must have traumatised her for life and perhaps explains, although never excuses, what happened later on. With the life insurance payout, which was only paid because there was some doubt as to whether it had been a suicide or an accident and which took a number of years to come through because of this, Barbara's mother Nini took her daughter to New York City. Once there, and with a good amount of money with them, they used the insurance settlement to set themselves up as socialites, enjoying mingling with the rich and famous. When they arrived in New York, Barbara and her mother took up residence in the iconic Delmonico Hotel. This was a high-class establishment where many wealthy people chose to live. Barbara learned from an early age what wealth and privilege could give her. She fit in just right with the new people she was spending time with and became a well-known socialite herself. She was even named one of New York's ten most beautiful girls. Once that happened, the world was truly Barbara's oyster and she gained some lucrative modelling contracts with Harper's Bazaar and Vogue. Of course, this meant that she became even more sought after in affluent circles and her name was everywhere. Barbara Daly had become a star. What this also meant was that Barbara could have her pick of men. She dated many different wealthy, important men, one of which was John Jacob Astor VI. What no one knew was that behind closed doors, once the party lights had gone out, Barbara was suffering from a mental illness. Although the records aren't clear, this may have been schizophrenia. This is certainly something Barbara's mother suffered from. To help her, Barbara would see Dr Foster Kennedy, a private psychiatrist. However, she did not want this information to get out. It would have damaged her reputation, which is not something she would ever have allowed to happen. Barbara's ambitions grew over time and she decided that she wanted to go to Hollywood to be an actress, and why not? With her beauty and her famous name, surely she would have been someone directors and producers wanted to meet. She flew out to Hollywood for a screen test, but unfortunately this didn't lead to any parts in any movies. However, what it did lead to was a chance encounter with another aspiring actress named Cornelia Bakeland. The two women spent all their time together and became firm friends. After a short while, Cornelia introduced Barbara to her brother, Brooks Bakeland. Brooks was a good-looking man with good manners, but although he was a trainee pilot with the Royal Canadian Air Force, he wasn't very exciting or particularly interesting and Barbara wasn't taken with him at all. However, when Barbara later discovered that Brooks and Cornelia came from one of the wealthiest families in America, she suddenly had a change of heart, and Brooks Bakeland, heir to the Bakelite Company, his grandfather Leo Bakeland essentially created plastic, became everything to her. She said she couldn't live without him. Barbara and Brooks became an official couple, but their relationship was not a stable one. While Barbara was waiting for the proposal that would have set her up for life, Brooks had decided that he could stand it no more and that the arguments and affairs on both sides were too much. He was ready to end the relationship for good. However, whether Barbara became aware of this or not, her patience was wearing thin and she wanted to become part of the Bakelite dynasty. She told Brooks she was pregnant and since this was 1944, they quickly got married. 
Barbara was not actually pregnant. She just didn't want to lose Brooks and the money that came with him. After the wedding, Barbara told Brooks she wasn't actually pregnant and, of course, this meant that an already rocky and probably very unsuitable relationship became even more strained. Although Brooks was truly disappointed about not becoming a father, Barbara couldn't have been happier. She was now Barbara Bakeland, and she was rich and powerful. Despite everything that happened, Brooks and Barbara stayed together. The scandal of a divorce wasn't something that the Bakeland family would have been very happy to contend with, so the pair set up home together in a luxury apartment on the Upper East Side in Manhattan. This apartment was a scene of many parties and rich, famous people from all over the country would attend, with Brooks and Barbara Bakeland pretending to be the ultimate power couple as they hosted. In reality, these parties would have been the ideal escape from a miserable marriage. During this time, Barbara's more unstable side started to show itself and people began to gossip that she might have some kind of mental health issue she would often have rude outbursts at her parties and she was no longer someone a lot of people wanted to spend time with. Of course, this might have had more to do with her drinking than anything else. Barbara was an alcoholic who would not be able to control her actions or her words once she was drunk. Brooks Bakeland had, by all accounts, tried to be a good husband. However, as Barbara's drinking and reputation grew worse, he went back to his old ways and had multiple affairs. Yet even so, in 1946, Barbara found she was pregnant for real. And on the 28th of August 1946, Barbara gave birth to Anthony Bakeland, who everyone called Tony. In 1960, the Bakeland family of three decided to change location and they moved to Paris. This move was not as innocent as it first seemed, however, it wasn't that the Bakelands were tired of New York, but more that New York was tired of them. Although the details aren't entirely clear, it would seem as though Barbara's drinking had reached critical levels and she had seriously embarrassed herself at an event. The entire Bakeland name was at risk of being dragged down and it's likely that one of the senior Bakelands persuaded Brooks to move his family away from New York. Of course, Brooks complied. It was in Paris that Brooks met someone he wanted more than an affair with. He wanted to marry this girl, and she really was a girl. The daughter of an English diplomat, she was just 15 at the time she met Brooks. Brooks told Barbara he wanted a divorce. Not only was Barbara shocked, Brooks had been with numerous women during their marriage but had never gone as far as asking for a divorce until now, but she was also jealous. This was a beautiful young girl, and Barbara felt she was losing her own looks at this time, at the age of 38. Barbara came up with a plan. She told Brooks she was going to kill herself, and she tried it. But she didn't try very hard, as she actually didn't want to die at all. In fact, all she wanted was to stay married to Brooks. Incredibly, Barbara's plan worked. Brooks told her he would stop seeing the girl whom he had previously described as the love of his life and stay with Barbara instead. So what about Tony Bakeland during all of this? Little Tony was brought up by nannies for the most part and really didn't have a lot to do with either of his parents. He was extremely spoiled, particularly by Barbara, and anything he asked for he got. It may be that Barbara felt guilty for not paying him any attention, or perhaps it was just that by buying her son gifts, she could show off how wealthy she was and indulge her love of spending. Whatever it was, there was really not much of a relationship between Tony and either of his parents. When Tony reached the age of 18, he decided to go travelling. He wanted independence, and he wanted to get away from his parents. By the time he was 20, in 1967, Tony decided to live in Italy, and one of the reasons for choosing Italy was that a man named Jake Cooper was there. Jake, a bisexual Australian man, introduced Tony to a world of drugs and pleasure that he had never been aware of before in his cloistered existence. The pair soon became a couple and lived together in Italy. 
However, apart from their closest friends, they told no one about this. It just wouldn't have been understood or accepted. Somehow, word got back to Barbara, who was still in Paris, that her only son was in a relationship with another man. She was not happy, and her actual words were, he will not make this family look bad. Barbara decided she would drive to Italy, collect Tony, and take him back to Paris with her so that she could fix him. Her word again. Barbara's plan was to set Tony up with a young girl. She really believed that Tony just hadn't met the right woman yet, and that when he did, his homosexuality would be forgotten. The girl Barbara had in mind was the daughter of a friend of hers called Sylvie. She was a beautiful Spanish girl and Barbara was sure Tony would fall instantly in love with her. The relationship between Tony and Sylvie appeared to move quickly, probably because Tony was doing what he was told. In the end, Tony, Sylvie, Barbara and Brooks were all living together. However, the plan was not working exactly as Barbara had imagined it would. In fact, not only was Tony seeing other men, which Sylvie was aware of and quite happy to allow, but Brooks was sleeping with Sylvie right under Barbara's nose. In 1968, things came to a head and Brooks asked for another divorce. This time, nothing could be done to dissuade the man and he and Barbara divorced. He went on to marry Sylvie. At the same time, Tony let his mother know that no matter what she did, he was gay and wanted to be in a romantic and sexual relationship with a man. All of this together must have devastated Barbara and certainly something seems to have snapped if her next plan is anything to go by. Barbara was so determined to rid Tony of his homosexuality that she decided she would seduce him herself. After all, she was beautiful, she'd been a model, she had many male admirers and had slept with plenty of men over the years. If anyone was going to turn Tony straight, it had to be her. And so, an incestuous relationship between mother and son began. It isn't known exactly how Barbara persuaded Tony to go along with this plan, but it may have been possible due to Barbara understanding Tony's fragile mental state and playing on that. Remember that Barbara's mother had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and that Barbara herself was seeing a psychiatrist. At some point during this turmoil, Tony was also diagnosed with schizophrenia. However, rather than getting any help, which would have been easier in 1968 than it would have been for his mother in 1944, or his grandmother even earlier than that, Brooks Bakeland dismissed the diagnosis. No son of his, no heir to the Bakelite fortune, could possibly be mentally unstable. And so, Tony got no help, and all he had was a manipulative, overbearing mother who was mentally unstable herself. In other words, Barbara was taking advantage of her son who was not getting the treatment he needed for his mental illness. By this time, Brooks had married Sylvie and had another child and he was not interested in what was happening with Tony so Barbara took the opportunity to move to London where no one knew them and they could carry on their experimental love affair in private. Yet Tony couldn't deal with the incest and he couldn't deal with hiding his true self. On the 17th of October 1972, when Tony was 25 and Barbara was 51, the young man killed her in their home. Tony heard his mother in the kitchen and he walked into the room, took a large knife from the counter and stabbed Barbara twice in the back. The first stab was almost enough to kill her and the second finished her completely. After this, Tony called the police and then waited for them to arrive. However, it is said that he was in such a state of shock by the time the police got there that he didn't even acknowledge his mother's body and he tried to order a Chinese takeaway rather than answering the police's questions. Tony admitted to killing Barbara, but he said that he did it because his mother was abusing him and he went on to tell a whole story of their relationship, his sexuality and his untreated mental illness. Due to the circumstances of the crime, rather than being sent to prison, Tony Bakeland was institutionalised at Broadmoor, 
a high security psychiatric hospital in Berkshire, where he stayed until the 21st of July 1980, at which point the doctors treating him determined he was safe to be let out. Tony Bakeland was 33 years old and he had nowhere to go. His mother was dead and his father wanted nothing to do with him, not only because of the murder, mental illness and homosexuality, but because Tony would send creepy looking handmade gifts to his young half-brother while he was in Broadmoor and this angered Brooks. This only left his 87-year-old maternal grandmother, who was still living in New York City. Sadly, it seems that this relationship was as toxic as all the others in Tony's life and it took just six days for something to go horribly wrong. On the 27th of July, Tony became angry with his grandmother because she didn't believe that Barbara had sexually abused him and she didn't approve of him being gay. In a rage, Tony attacked his grandmother with a kitchen knife, stabbing her eight times. She survived the attack, but Tony was obviously arrested for attempted murder and sent to prison. Tony didn't expect to be in prison for very long. His lawyer said he had a good chance of getting out on appeal and after eight months he was waiting to hear news of his release. Unfortunately, Tony didn't get the news he was waiting for. There was actually a delay in some paperwork being sent across to the court and that meant the hearing would have to be postponed. This made Tony incredibly upset, and when he returned to his cell on the 20th of March 1981, he committed suicide by placing a plastic bag over his head. Thank you so much for watching my video. If you enjoyed the content, click the subscribe and like button so you can receive more content like this strange story every week. See you next time.